So the question I'm asking today is, is Australia in agriculture adapting as usual? So, so what's, what's the status of it at the moment? So I'll just go through a few things. One is, of course, is that agriculture, as with other business, is constantly adapting. That's the normal part of business. In fact, that's business advantage, is effective adaptation. Agriculture's been pretty extreme in terms of what it's adapted to. So what this graph shows is reductions in numbers of farms, about 40% over the last 35 years, and reductions in terms of trade. They're about half of what they were about 35 years ago. These changes are massive. Um, and they have changed the face of the industries, um, they have changed the face of the landscape and the communities who live in that landscape. So adaptation is normal. Uh, if we actually look at uh, the, in terms of the scale of different industries, um, just this is a, uh, an ABES graph which just shows on one graph what's happened to the sheep and cattle industries and the crop industries. And what you can see there is that there's variation um, in terms of the scale of these industries. Uh, some of them go up, some of them go down. But importantly, the relativities between those industries change over time. That forces adaptation. If we actually start to think about this, there's also increasingly uh, an impact of climate, which is evident, and I'll show you in the next few slides about that. And that's evident at different levels. It's evident at farm level, regional, industry, national, and international levels. If we start just looking at that climate change at the farm level, um, this is a quote from John Pettigrew. And uh, you know, much of the rains come in summer storms, less in autumn, winter, and spring. It's just like seeing the climate change projections come true in front of our eyes. It's a really telling statement for me that says, this is reality, this is my understanding of what's going on, this is my understanding of the future, and I'm going to change, I'm going to adapt to fit myself into that future. I'm going to adapt my business uh, accordingly. So the rationale for adaptation in agriculture is really strong, simply because the impacts of climate on agriculture are really strong. And when we actually start to uh, look at different aspects of this, we actually see strong evidence for uh, adoption of what we call incremental adaptation, so it's adaptation to the existing farming systems at that farm level. But really hard to tease out what is happening because of climate variation, what's happening because of climate change, what's happening because of uh, market prices and dollar um, exchange rates and various other things. So there's lots of other stuff going on. So it's very hard to be definitive about it. Um, but there is some evidence, so this is a results from a survey by Image and Schwartz and uh, colleagues, it's in the poster straight outside this door. And so I just took the results from that poster. Um, sorry Image, and I didn't get a chance to talk to you about that. But, um, the, but I have acknowledged it of course. And, uh, um, but what this shows, a really interesting survey, and there's other similar surveys, which shows that a lot of farmers in this region are already adapting to what they see as climate change. And so they're changing their business management and structures, they're changing their enterprise mix, and some of them are actually starting new enterprises and some of them looking for land in safer places to share that risk uh, which otherwise they occur. So good evidence that people are actually stating um, that they're changing in relation to climate responses. Another adaptation at farm level is, is zero till. So a standard sort of thing that comes up in conversations would be if we're going to have a more variable, drier, hotter climate, zero till is one of the agronomic options. This is a, a graph coming out of the work from uh, Rick Llewellyn, uh, which shows over decades the uptake of zero till um, in the black bars of Western Australia, the white bars of South Australia. Um, and what this shows is that even for a relatively simple and direct agronomic uh, adaptation to climate and other stresses, is that the time lags between initiation of the idea and uptake broadly in the community can actually be really long. And, and this is even in Western Australia, which is probably one of the prime locations for this particular practice. It's less so in the eastern states. So there's a, part of the understanding of we, what we need in terms of incremental adaptation is understanding what actually drives or hinders the adoption of these practices, even when there seems to be a good case uh, for taking them up. And the question is, I suppose, is given that it's effectively taken four decades for adoption in this case, can we actually afford that sort of lag in the system given the rates of climate change that we are already seeing and expect in the future? So if we go back to this particular uh, um, technology, as my understanding is that it was uh, a farmer-led uh, sort of uh, in innovation over in the US as a function of the first uh, oil crisis back in the early 70s. And, and so 
it, it, the actual trigger for this had nothing to do with climate change. And, and it was a real long time ago. And it happened in a different continent. And so, so the, the sort of the innovation path for these is actually really difficult to pr predict. And so it's sort of a lot of it comes down to a sort of a much more understanding of learning systems, the thing that Jason Alexandra uh, mentioned in his presentation yesterday. So one of the agendas for science is actually to reduce these lags between the time of initiation, whether it's a science-driven innovation or an industry-driven um, innovation, and actually fast-track these things in sensible ways. So, and if we actually look at how farmers think and change their thinking about adaptation, this is some work uh, from Steve Crimp. So he's just finishing a, a DAF-funded uh, national project on adaptation across the cropping and grazing industries. And the first survey that he did with these farmers and, and looking at um, adaptations, everything back in 2007, everything was very much agronomic uh, um, adaptations. So it was you know, zero till um, sowing opportunities and being up more opportunistic, um, soil testing for nitrogen and water. It's fairly ag standard agronomic practices. As this group went through the process, um, their understanding of what was needed in terms of adaptation changed. And so at the end of this, it was actually much more about business management, simplification, labour efficiency, um, ac accessing more information and knowledge, having good pathways to use that information and knowledge. So as people go down this adaptation journey, their understanding of what that journey changes and the understanding of their goals also changes. But this is already happening at the farm level. Over and above that sort of farm level change, we're already seeing evidence of much more systemic changes at national and higher levels. Um, but again, these are often confounded by other factors. So it's not 100% clear how much uh, climate is impacting on these. So one example of this is if we look across Australia's high rainfall zone, um, what we've seen during the period of the, the millennium drought is a really significant increase in the area that's cropped in this zone. So this is a zone where historically it's been a bit wet for effective cropping uh, activities, um, but with the long drought, as people were saying, well, it's actually now about the right sort of rainfall for cropping. And so there was a significant expansion, which you can see on that graph. And so it almost went up by a factor of two within that high rainfall zone. Um, of course, that it just doesn't happen in isolation. As the cropping area goes up, the grazing area goes down. And, and so this was in spite of the fact that the relativities of, of uh, grazing activities in terms of price were actually probably positive in this environment. Um, the opportunity for growing uh, crops, which actually have a higher gross margin per hectare, um, overrode that, and we saw a change in land use partially as a function of climate. Now, there were other things happening at the same time, so new varieties which were more uh, able to grow in this environment um, and various other things, but nevertheless, there's probably a fingerprint of climate change in these land use changes in this region. If we look at a national scale in terms of uh, imports and exports of major industries, this is vegetables, and I'll show fruit in the next slide, is that looking back over a decade, we actually had uh, an excess um, of, in terms of exports to imports in the value of vegetable. Um, so our exports were greater than our imports. Uh, along came the Millennium Drought, which is that uh, orange uh, bar there. And what we saw is a significant drop in the value of those exports, a significant increase as a function of that in terms of the value of imports, and now we have a major deficit in terms of our vegetables. Uh, and so our import value is much higher than our export value. So what seemed to happen there is that people were generally happy with their supply chains. Um, up to that millennium drought, supply chains became threatened. They went and found new suppliers. Um, over a period of time, they had to go through, obviously, the, the challenges of doing that. Over a period of time, they're actually happy with those new supply chains. So even when the millennium drought's finished, we actually don't see the bounce back. Um, that we would have otherwise expected. So, so there's these um, hysteretic effects um, in terms of these systems um, that need to be taken into account. So this is a huge change in terms of, of our systems and, and our ability to provide adequate uh, commodities uh, within our domestic system. Same sort of story in fruit, but not quite so extreme. We saw a, a big excess of exports versus imports. Going back a decade, along came the millennium drought. Uh, our, um, Exports effectively um, flatlined, um, our imports increased, and we see now a deficit there which doesn't seem to be um, closing up following the, the wet years, the La Nina years we've experienced in the last couple of years. So again, uh, arguably a significant climate signal um, in things that are happening at this national level.
If we look internationally, amongst other things, we've seen massive increases in volatility um, in uh, forward trading. So wheat, maize and soybeans, steady increases over a decade or more in terms of that volatility, and then huge spikes in part driven by climate factors. So this was uh, the global food crisis back in uh, 2008. And, and part of that was uh, droughts in some of the big commodity producing countries, but there were other things happening at the same time, uh, in, including very high uh, oil prices, etc. But this actually is extreme volatility that you're actually dealing with in these markets. So we're actually going from the, the ex existing sort of market framing, which is essentially sort of known or unknown knowns, which is essentially just your risk profile. And we're actually going into the territory of unknown unknowns because the volatility of volatility has actually increased. And some of the most um, probably clear evidence for uh, people actually adapting in the prospect or, or reality of climate change as they see it is what we call transformational change. This is the bigger changes in farming systems. And so we've got uh, work going on with some industries, the wise, um, wine, rice and peanut industries, um, to actually understand the process of change that they're going through. So in each case they've had sort of clear transformational changes which are driven in part by uh, climate factors, in, in some cases mostly by climate factors. And there's several papers in this uh, conference, um, Peter Thorburn, Asia Fleming and uh, Estelle Gayard, uh, who you can actually go to uh, to see the details of that uh, work there. And in conclusion, uh, that question is climate adaptation, business as usual. Well, I'd, I'd actually suggest, or we'd suggest, that ad adaptation to climate change is qualitatively different. Uh, from dealing with other drivers of change. Um, and as a function of that, it requires holistic responses um, that integrate that farm level uh, responses, industry and government policy. The changes are, as I put up there, directional, they're systemic, they're multi-level, they're dealing with unknown unknowns, and so your standard risk management approaches do not any apply fully any longer. So we actually have to think about different approaches to this. So it is outside your standard sort of business model. And so I would actually conclude by saying that adaptation in this sector is and needs to be somewhat business as unusual, but that is good business nevertheless. Thank you.